c'est deux. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Serious Security Seminar at Purdue University. Uh, since uh, today is the first lecture um, of this semester, uh, I'll explain some basic rules. So for those of you who are taking this for credit, you need to sign up on a sign-up sheet uh, each time, check your name. Um, and if you miss uh, more than two lectures, you have to make up for the ones over two. You do that by watching the video online afterwards and then uh, send a one-page description of the talk to me uh, to prove that you have uh, watched it. And because the serious computers are down uh, today, so we do not have the actual sign-up sheet ready, so we just have a, a we, ju we will just hand out this piece of paper so that you can write down your name and sign. Um, so today it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Christina Nitarotaro. Um, Professor Nitarotaro joined the Purdue Computer Science Department the same year as I did uh, in 2003. Actually, I think we've been next door neighbors. Uh, yes, from yes, the beginning. Ever, from the beginning. Yes, yes. Yeah. although we moved in a different building, yeah. but we still. Yeah, so Professor uh, uh, Nitaro Haro um, has been uh, very active in uh, networking and distributed system research, um, and he has had uh, uh, several very wonderful students in the past. And today uh, he will talk about uh, secure network coding for wireless mesh networks. Thank you very much, Ningui, and uh, it's great to be here. I was actually making the comment that I will never work in television. I hate these lights, so you have no idea how bright they are, and they just come to um, your eyes. Um, I'm also very glad to see a few familiar faces here. Uh, I, I've seen some of you guys in the past, uh, so it's nice to see you here. Um, what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about some of the work that uh, I have been doing with uh, a former student of mine, he just recently graduated, and another student was a postdoc here and he's now a faculty member at uh, NGIT. And before getting into this talk, I wanted to ask how many of you took networking? Okay, so when we look at networking, how do you, uh, was the first thing that you learned in terms of how packets are sent from one party to another. So what will a router do? The most basic action. Hi. Examine the destination. And do that what? Look up tables to figure out what to do with them. So, but the most basic question, action is actually just to forward the packet whatever packet was received. The reason that I'm saying this is because network coding questions and proposes a different way of building networks, starting with this very basic action. So you are all used from uh, networking classes to look about uh, and think about protocols as the traditional routing where any participant in a network protocol will forward the packet in the form that it was received. Network coding proposes a very different way of building networks. So it, what, what it proposes is instead of just forwarding the received packet, a router or an entity that is involved in the, in the routing process will wait for a certain number of packets and then what it will forward is a linear combination of those packets. Okay, so you receive certain of them, you send only one out. It turns out that this very simple idea actually allows you to build systems with uh, benefits in terms of performance that we were not able to do before. So we can get higher throughput, higher reliability, robustness, energy efficiency, and we can leverage this type of mechanism for many applications. We can leverage them for wireless, for peer-to-peer -peer systems. Uh, there are proposals also of how to do this for delay tolerant networks, vehicular networks. So I just wanted, this is not a lecture about network coding, but I just wanted to show you two examples of why, um, um, you know, people were very excited about them when they uh, first were proposed. So for example, you can really get better throughput. So if you look in the two diagrams that we have here on the page, on the left, no matter what you do, if you want to do multicast, your throughput is always going to be one because you're limited. If you look, this is called the butterfly network. The link that is in between, if you want to send two packets, you can never send more than one packet on that link. That link is your bottleneck. However, with network coding, which, as I said, the main idea is that you or the, the route, routers are allowed to send 
combinations, linear combinations of received packets, you can actually get a higher throughput. Why? Because on the bottleneck, I can set a sort message, like I can set A sort with B, so I can still send one message that contains the information about both messages A and B, and uh, at the same time, the two recipients, they can actually recover both packets A and B. Okay? So there are some uh, advantages. I, I want to show you another example, the one with uh, delay, because this is also something that is interesting. Just think about you want to do multicast and you want to the source to multicast to packets to three receivers. If you look at the example in the left, no matter what you do, it's always going to take you three hops to send the packet. And actually with network coding, we can do that in two hops. If one of the, the packets that it's sent, it's actually a coded packet. It's going to be the sort of the two packets that I wanted to send A and B. Um, so these are just uh, uh, some examples. Um, but in order for network coding to work, there are actually some assumptions. So the assumptions there are is that, um, let's say that somehow, first of all, the, there is this, uh, or what it can be leveraged and it can be useful if broadcast comes for free. Right, which is very, for example, is very natural in wireless networks. I send the packet, everybody that is around can hear it. Uh, the other thing that it, it's, it's very useful if you can have this type, it's called opportunistic listening, which basically means uh, you are in the proximity to receive some packets. And those packets may not necessarily be for you, but the assumption is think about the example with A sort with B and B where you want A. You can always get A if you have the sort of A and B and B. And the B you have, you maybe received it just because you were around. It just happened that that packet uh, was broadcast and you were in its proximity. Um, so because of that, you can get all these benefits that I was mentioning before. Now going to uh, uh, how people thought about to apply network coding in the context of wireless networks, which they're really a very natural environment to try to build uh, network systems uh, using network coding. Um, people thought about coding in two ways. You can code within the same flow or session, which means you have one source that has to send packets to multiple destinations. So you can code packets across this flow. Um, or you can cross packets, we can code uh, packets across multiple flows if you have multiple destinations in the system. So as a, as a classification based on how coding is done, we have systems that are called intraflow network coding systems and others that are called interflow network coding systems. So both of them have certain aspects that, as we will see, uh, make them... Uh, um, less robust when we are start to think as an adversary. So I wanted to show you an example of how do you take that simple idea of just, I'm not going to forward the packet, I'm going to forward the linear combination and actually build a system. Um, so for example, when we look at the intraflow network coding system, the way systems like that uh, work is that the packets that have to be sent by the source are divided in what they're called generations. So you can just think, I'm going to you know, divide this, uh, these packets in groups. One such group is called generation. And what happens is that the source is going to move from one generation to another. So when it wants to send the generation, the goal is for this set of packets to be received by the receivers. It's going to be a set of them. In this picture, we have only one of them. So how it works, the source is going to create coded packets based on these packets from the generation. The one, m m many systems, what they do, they do a random linear combination of this. You just randomly generate coefficients and you create a linear combination of these plain packets. You obtain a coded packet. And then forward the nodes, what they do, they will buffer the overhead co coded packets. They may decide to create new coded packets. So again, we're going to have another other linear combinations. And the reason why all this works is because if the receiver receives as many packets as the generation, uh, as, as uh, how big the generation is, recovering the plain packets really comes down to solving a system with um, n unknowns. And we have n equations. We can solve it. The receivers can recover the packets. Okay? And once that happened, the receiver will tell the source, got the packets, move on to the next generation. 
it's not so complicated. Now, in interflow, it's slightly more complicated in the fact that because we have to mix now, or the system have now to mix packets across multiple sources, and then it's not always um, uh, easy to decide when can you code. The reason is because not everybody has to receive all the packets as in the, the previous case. So there are some conditions that have to be met. One of them is this decodability condition. So in other words, in order to be able to decode, you will need to have the other packets that were part of the combination in order to, to create that. So this brings me to why I do I care about all this. I care about, uh, not that I don't care about network coding. I think that they're very important. but. Uh, um, I care about security, and if I'm an adversary, I always think about, okay, this is a new system. It looks like it's so good because it optimizes and it has all this great performance. Um, how does it, how is it going to behave if some of the nodes, uh, or if the system is placed in an adversarial environment, or maybe even some of the nodes don't behave correctly? And the thing is that if you think about network coding, in, in some sense, just because of the fact that the routers now, they have to create new content based on previous content, they really do change the trust model, right? Because the routers now actively create new content as opposed to just forwarding what they received before. And that changes a lot the rules of the game. So what I want to do in the next few minutes, I want to give you some idea of what type of vulnerabilities can happen in systems like that. Um, and to keep the discussion focused, I'm going to then pick one particular attack that um, it's uh, both new and very damaging. And I'm going to keep the discussion in the context of one class of network coding systems, which are the, uh, the, the, more, the less complex one, the one where the coding happens within a flow. And I'm going to show you, you know, some uh, limitations of w w some, what some other people did, what worked, what didn't work, and I'm going to show you our solution and some experiments um, and what happened there. And just to keep things uh, clear, when I talk about network coding, I'm here I mean network coding at the routing level. So the, the, the attacker is not messing up with the uh, Mac. I assume that I can trust the Mac, and that the attacker will do things at the routing level, you know, like is dropping, injection, modification, uh, and all kind of other wireless um, uh, specific uh, attacks. Um, but first, let's get even more in, in, in details. So, um, I give you some idea of how you know you would do intraflow with the, for example, with the generation. The reality is that in wireless, you cannot have all nodes starting now coding and sending at the same time because you have collisions, so you're, you, you can end up with having higher error rates. So there, there are a little bit um, more complex things that you need to do. You need to be a little bit more careful if you want to design a system that works. So when you look at the intraflow network coding, for example, components that um, um, need to be addressed and they are part of design of such system. One and the most uh, uh, and and doesn't look like uh, uh, from the in the beginning that you need it, but it's actually very important is to select who nodes are going to code and at what rate. Rate is important. You cannot just start sending, you know, because you're going to have collision. Then obviously we have the coding and decoding part, which is really the core of the system. And then we need this acknowledgement that will basically tell the source that it that now the source can move to the next um, uh, to the next generation. And also the interflow network coding has. Uh, um, some components, we have to discover when, when, when can we code. 